we've seen a legality around safety deposit boxes change in the last 10 years um, or, or less, where uh, they're now legally bank property. You know, and, and we've seen this play out. The amount of liquidity that was in the FDIC insurance fund, again, this is to backstop all checking accounts and savings accounts. Last I looked at these statistics, the, the, uh, the cash reserves of New York Life insurance company was, was higher. There was more money in New York Life's cash reserves than there was in the entire FDIC. And I think it was a handful, less than $10 billion. And there's a lot more than that sitting in, in checking and savings accounts nationally. Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. It's been over a year since we've had this returning guest with us. Will Lear is the co-founder of Perpetual Assets. He's been on with us in the past talking about self-storage IRAs, as well as cryptocurrency and blockchain technology and its promise. Will, thanks for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me back on. My pleasure. Both of the topics, and we'd like to hit on them both again tonight, are of high interest to our viewers because they are trying to reduce risk that's imposed by opting into this all encompassing system that continues to grow and feed on itself and abstract further and further from us and not allow us to take sort of individual uh, possession or ownership or or always having this this uh, third party risk in between us and anything that that we have of value so people are trying to find ways to shortcut that and bring things back closer to themselves and, and more within their own control but uh, if you could first kind of set the stage for us on what you've been seeing and the people you've been talking with are, are commenting on in the broader economy and some of the trends and risks that we're seeing there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we operate, v for the most part, very much in a, a niche sort of space. Um, I mean, uh, with with like-minded folks, like probably like many of your listeners, where um, we're concerned about the economy at large, the financial system at large, the banking system, the political system, the, the power uh, control mechanism. Um, and so most people that come to us are already educated and, and well-versed and, and know that they need to do something. Um, in fact, when Gus and I started the company back six, seven years ago, we were working in the precious metal space and we learned about um, this type of self-directed IRA where the individual can uh, take control of the investments and drive the investments him or herself uh, and in many cases take custody of the investments, um, including tangible investments. So, you know, people who aren't just stuck with this, uh, you know, regular basket of min uh, uh, mutual funds or mm -hmm. stocks and, and bonds offerings. So we got very excited about it and knew there was a place for it. It was a, it's a, a little known um, type of structure in the tax code. It was authored into existence by a congressional attorney some 30 years ago, and it's been used by insiders, um, and it's available to us common folk as well. So we learned about it, and ha being in the metal space and having a lot of clients who had um, you know, cashed out the 401k or the IRA, paid the taxes and penalties, right. You know, uh, in the fear of, of losing those accounts, and if you have one, you, you know, you and 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 you're a listener of yours, or you follow a lot of these trends, um, you you know what I what I'm speaking of. It's it's usually a large chunk of money that's in one of those things, uh, at least you know relative to the individual, um, a nice portion of of one's earnings or life savings, I should say, and. When you come to the realization uh, of the realities around our financial and banking system, um, the bail-ins, the, um, the counterparty risk, the, uh, the Bernie Madoff situations of the world, 
you you realize, holy cow, I don't know if this if this money is going to be safe or, or if I'm ever even going to be able to get my hands on this stuff. Um, so the folks that we talk to are um, already pretty pretty well understood that uh, I, the, all these counterparties between myself and my assets are not a good thing. So um, I'm seeing, um, you know, things get crazier every day. And I swear, I, I, it seems like I've been saying that for years. Um, you know, even, even three, four, five years ago, it, it felt, it's always felt very terminal. Uh, but much, much as they say, you know, Rome didn't fall in a day, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, and I think that's the same situation that's playing out right now. We're witnessing the uh, change of guard, if you will. We're witnessing the uh, slow unwind of a you know multi-thousand-year legacy system, and I don't think that we're just going to go off of the U.S. dollar and go back to another uh, fiat, a different, a different fee, like from the sterling to the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we're going to just transition onto another uh, fiat currency. I, you know, I think that it's going to be a huge um, paradigm shift away from these sort of central controlled mechanisms into something more, um, more decentralized, more uh, regional more controlled, um, not controlled from a central party. So um, I've really enjoyed uh, watching some of your guests recently. There, you've had some great, uh, in fact, you had to be one of the first people to break the news of the um, the, the Basel III, the, the, B, the Bank of International mm -hmm. Settlements, uh, changing gold's um, status to a, to a zero risk asset, which is, I mean, such a massive development that we're that we're just not hearing about for obvious reasons in Western media. In fact, I think it was initially aired in, in the Italian press. Uh, so kudos to you and and your channel and uh, all the work you've been doing. It's been I actually really have to give the credit to one of our viewers. Uh, we had, <clears throat> as we often do, we we put out the call for viewers questions before having a guest on, and that was part of part of it. And frankly, I couldn't even pronounce it correctly at the time. And, and uh, that was eye opener for me as well. And that's been true for a lot of things I've learned here from questions that our viewers have asked of our guests. Um, mm -hmm. So what is your outlook on the economy currently? You, you were talking before the interview about how we're kind of in this ether land uh, where it's, it's difficult to tell because you can't apply traditional necessarily traditional technical analysis or fundamental analysis for sure when you look at the valuations in a lot of the markets but what are you seeing and what are your concerns about the current markets I think um, we're seeing the uh, the last shakeout uh, I think that we are witnessing um, the last of the effects of QE of this permanent QE that we've been under um, even if even if the Federal Reserve has tightened, um, there's still been a lot of backdoor easing. The Exchange Stabilization Fund, which we're not even supposed to talk about, there, there's a lot of backdoor easing taking place that's been propping up these phony markets. Uh, I mean, direct asset purchases um, and direct liquid injections into asset markets. Um, it's interesting when I hear people like Kyle Bass, who I respect very much, uh, say that they're very bullish on bonds, um, government bonds, even in this current space. And that's probably a flight to safety uh, type of mechanism where we're going to see, um, I mean, there's trillions and trillions of dollars out there floating around. And when we see some volatility come back into the equity markets, um, I think that you could see bonds rally. I'm certainly not an advocate for, for government bonds, but uh, I'm more of an advocate for these tangible assets, you know, precious metals. I've been a huge fan of physical precious metals in your possession, in a hole in your backyard. It sounds crazy, but the bank of Mother Earth has got to be one of the best places. Um, uh, cryptocurrencies, if you're uh, if you're open to that space, I know a lot of people, especially in the um, in the hard asset community, and our prepper friends, 
have been slow to warm up to cryptocurrencies, but the technology is sound and um, it's definitely a space to keep an eye out and definitely a space to implore some some funds if if you're willing, you know, if you're willing to, to learn a little bit and feel comfortable there. Um, real estate, of course, the right kind of real estate, um, private equity as well. But these sort of non-traditional asset classes, uh, I think, is where the safety, uh, the safe havens will be. It wouldn't surprise me if we see, you know, Fortune 100 type global blue chip companies become a flight to safety as well. You know, uh, the types of companies that own infrastructure and assets all over the world and, and these types of real tangible items that we've just been discussing that companies own where you can <clears throat> get exposure to those things by owning shares of the company. Um, but I think that, you know, with the the Trump phenomenon that we've been seeing play out over the last two plus years, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic <clears throat> excuse me, uh, but it <clears throat> it appears that uh, there is major, major commotion playing out behind the scenes. I mean, and that's that's a pretty broad and obvious statement at this point. Um, so uh, it, I can only imagine what is happening in meetings behind closed doors. Um, but it appears that we are witnessing a massive purge take place that um, certain power elites and structures that exist that have controlled systems and infrastructure and currencies, the issuance of currency, really. I mean, uh, what Rothschild said it, uh, Nathaniel or one of them, that uh, let me control and issue a nation's currency and I care not who writes its laws. And it's the control of the issuance of currency that is central banking that is really the problem with our current world today is this uh all of the currencies of the world are are, are created by uh based completely on debt you know so i see that changing i see um i see humanity evolving and it's not going to be easy and it's going to take some time and certainly there will be bumps in the road but i, I think it, the, the fuse has been lit and it's playing out as we speak You've mentioned, and I kind of asked you maybe a little bit too specifically about markets, and you've been answering that question. But what do you see about the the world economy, the both the U.S. Uh, domestic economy as well as world economies? What do you think the, re the reality is on the ground? Oh man, you know, um, it's it's it is a big convoluted mess, and it's really difficult to um, to get it to get an idea on how that's going to play out with the economy, but. Um, you know, I, I, I it, it, it appears that um, there are there is definitely growth in certain sectors. You know, we are seeing uh, positive signs in certain sectors. That could be a result of a stimulus or a result of a, a, a change. You know, a change of stimulus from from one area into another. Um, but the, the U.S. is still the world's, you know, one of the world's top economies, I mean, in the history of the world. Uh, what we have here is an entrepreneurial ability and an ingenuity that uh, is really second to none. So I remain confident that no matter how the cookie crumbles, um, the U.S. will um, will fare well, you know, um, I mean, certainly it's going to, you know, there's, there's a lot of debt. There's a lot of excesses in the system that have to be cleansed. But, um, from an economic perspective, I think that, uh, we will be quick to get on our feet again. When we spoke to you about a year ago, uh, we had just past a big peak run up in the crypto space and a lot of the cryptocurrency markets were in what we were considering to be like I was like a four month grinding bear market at the time well that went a lot longer after after that but now what do you see happening uh, do you believe that the more that this recent like last week or two of uh, movement upward in the crypto space is the reawakening for some reason and what do you think is driving that and do you think it's real or is it just a, a bump on the on a further uh, bear market you know, if 2018 taught me anything, it was that uh, 
the the crypto markets and and really any market for that matter is very difficult to uh, to gauge. Um, I'll be the first to be honest and say I was full of irrational exuberance at the end of 2017, uh, participating in that marketplace and watching the valuations um, and experiencing that was just incredible. Of course, when you're an individual who for the last decade has been uh, studying this this paradigm shift, this inevitable paradigm shift that's taking place with the belief that this this technology uh, of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology is going to have a, a massive role in um, uh, creating systems and infrastructure that allow us to, uh, you know, break these chains of this previous system. Um, it's easy to get sucked into that irrational exuberance and go, "Oh my gosh, this is it! It's finally here!" You know, um, but it just it, it, it wasn't here yet, and it's still not here yet. So, um, yeah, 2018 was, um, was brutal for crypto investors. But if you kept your, um, if you kept your sights set on the, uh, you know, the, the fundamentals of this technology and the fundamentals of, um, these companies and, uh, the opportunity. And I mean, if you just, if you really dive into the space and you look at, um, mergers and acquisitions and you look at uh, on-ramps being built and you look at huge progress uh, and involvement by Fortune 100 companies and 500 companies, um, it's, no, it's no you know, surprise that this, um, this technology is here to stay. This most recent bump up that we've had, um, at first I was quite cautious with it because um, you know, much like a, a bull market creates this irrational exuberance, a, a bear market will create this sort of uh, skepticism. It, yeah, <laughs> extreme skepticism, yeah. right? Um, you know, there was the there was the the one trade or or one one hundred million dollar investor that uh, caused at least that's the story anyway that caused Bitcoin to break out. If you look at the weekly candle on the weekly charts, it's very very solid, very bullish. I'm most impressed by the last five or six or seven trading days where I was expecting a little more of a, of a pullback and it, and it really hasn't, hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's showing signs of a, uh, you know, of a, of a floor being in place. Um, I think, and I have for some time that, you know, these, these market caps are so small relative, relatively speaking that um, as we have larger institutional money and investors uh, not even uh, not even on the on the high on the large large scale I mean your Goldman Sachs of the world they can't even buy into these yep. markets they yep. just build the on ramps and then they'll profit there um, but I think your you know your billionaires of the world as they uh, slowly through the last 18 months try to get funds into this market and I think it's been happening the whole time if we look at over the counter trading uh, as over the counter trading and volumes and supplies over 2018 and and this this first quarter uh first three months of um of 20 uh what are we in <laughs> 2019 that um there's been considerable uh, acquisition taking place from these from these higher net worth individuals and funds and and investment classes. So um, that's going to move markets, and that might be what just moved the market. You know, this last time, and mm -hmm. to see it jump and then start to sort of stabilize there uh, is indicative of that. That uh, now again, I've I um, I definitely would would still tread cautiously. I mean, it's definitely a space you don't want to miss out on, but you also, you know, don't want to dump a hundred percent of your your investment mm -hmm. into it, your your anticipated investment into it right now, because it might pull back further. So maybe you maybe you'd put half of it now and stay on the sidelines with the other half and see what happens, knowing that well, it might keep going. We might consolidate here for another period of time before. Uh, rising up again and into into uh, into new yearly highs. So 
and then we, we could considerably, we could drop back down. But, um, I, you know, it's, it's really hard to say. Mm -hmm. I, I do know that there are these, these crypto, uh, currency, you know, conferences and, and meetings that I've been to, they're very, very smart, very influential people involved in this space. Um, and it's not going anywhere. So, uh, dollar cost averaging is always a, a smart and conservative way to, you know, uh, get involved, you know, wonder if we should uh, turn the coin over here, uh, so to speak, and talk about uh, <laughs> self-storage IRAs, uh, getting back to the physical, the tangible, the el eliminating all counterparties and that sort of thing, or as many as you can, between you and your assets, the fruits of your labor. Uh, you have been involved for some time at Perpetual Assets and helping people get set up with self-storage IRAs. Remind us what your current latest research shows on the, the legality the uh, span of, of options that people have available, the, the control that they can attain, because a lot of people are still stuck in 401ks and traditional IRAs with their employer or whatever, and are concerned that if there was an upset in a flight to safety or some, any kind of an event that might cause uh, a disruption in the capital markets that and, and the equity markets, that they could be stuck like we got a mailing from Citibank. We had an interview with Gregory Manorino not that long ago where we talked about locked out of our accounts. Uh, we actually got an uh, official multifold open card glossy thing from Citibank saying that they're establishing, they didn't call it capital controls, but they said <laughs> for our benefit, they're adding uh, transfer limits and it'll be up to their discretion as when and how much and when to install that. Is You get the feeling, okay, at least we're getting a heads up here that, that locks are being installed on the door frame at this point uh, between us and our, and our assets. So uh, what other options do people need to be aware of that they may not be? Yeah, we've seen the war on cash. Uh, I mean, gosh, what is it, five, six years old, 10 years old now? I mean, we've seen this slow, I mean, <laughs> this slow play out of capital controls, as you said, um, playing out for a considerable amount of time here, uh, quietly and slowly being rolled out. Uh, even even uh, when Basil, I think a handful of years ago, changed the, um, uh, changed the classification of money market funds from, uh, uh, from one side of the, of the balance sheet to the other. They're actually now liabilities to the, to the, to the, uh, to the bank. So, um, and, and they're all, I should say, money market funds or cash equivalents are all short-term U.S. treasuries now. Uh, this is a four, five trillion dollar uh, marketplace of, of, of short-term uh, cash equivalent uh, accounts. You know, if you call your broker, or your equities, you know, your stock broker and say, hey, sell my, sell my stocks, they go into what would be money market. Uh, the same thing as cash. But that's not cash anymore, and I, I think it was partly to conjure up demand for, for short-term treasuries uh, and partly in an effort of, of capital controls. Uh, those, those are all now short-term treasuries, those, those cash accounts. It's not a liquid you know, checking account type of product. Um, we've also seen, uh, uh, and I think it was Basil that did this as well, we've seen the, um, we've seen the legality around safety deposit boxes change in the last – 10 years um, or, or less, where uh, they're now legally bank property, you know, and, and we've seen this play out. And there was times. that law that came out, uh, clarified rule uh, not that long ago, saying that uh, depositors are now officially clarified as unsecured uh, creditors to the bank. So you're going to stand in line behind everybody who's ahead of you. Not That's not your funds you've got in the banks. It's now the banks and you're just you've just loaned those to the bank to use for however they wanted. Correct. Yeah, and, and, and I guess we're still left with FDIC coverage for people who have a chunk yeah, of money. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> Can you tell but, people about what the reality is behind that? Yeah, I don't know the actual hard number, uh, but last I looked, the, uh, the amount of liquidity that was in the FDIC insurance fund, again, this is to backstop all checking accounts and savings accounts, uh, up to a certain amount. Is it a hundred thousand or is it a quarter of a million? They've raised it. Yeah. And it's per, per depositor or per, per, per institution or whatever. You have to be careful about what it's, what it's actually saying. Right, right. But this is supposed to be the insurance. Like, Oh, if your bank fails, uh, the FDIC will step in. The government's and, got and your back. Yeah. Government's. Yeah. They've got your back. Last I looked at these statistics, 
the the uh, the cash reserves of New York Life Insurance Company was was higher. There was more money in New York Life's cash reserves than there was in the entire FDIC, and I think it was a handful, less than ten billion dollars. And there's a lot more than that sitting in in checking and savings accounts nationally. So um, the the IRA LLC that we set up is an option for folks. It's a type of self-directed IRA uh, that allows the individual to manage the investments, manage the funds. Um, it, it typically it involves we, we, we set up a, a trust account as a self-directed IRA trustee. We assist in the rollover from the funds from uh, you know Merrill Lynch or Fidelity or whatever bank or institution they might currently be at, the IRA funds or the 401k funds, and we roll them over into this self-directed IRA trust account, which then purchases a limited liability company. And one of the last steps is the individual the, uh, goes and opens a, a bank account, a checking account in this name of this company. And at their local bank or credit union, and that is where their rollover dollars go. And the individual has what's called uh, checkbook control over the retirement account. So you literally have a checkbook. You have access to to wires or whatever form of uh, you know payment you wish to make. You have access to your retirement funds for investment purposes only. Right? You can't take this money out and use it personally. Um, you can't, uh, you know, pay off your primary mortgage or buy a home for yourself or send your kid to college. You know, it's strictly for investment. But if you think of yourself as a, uh, you know, as a hedge fund manager, uh, that's exactly what you are. You're a hedge fund manager of your own retirement account. But it allows um, investment into all of these different alternative asset classes that we've been discussing. Uh, precious metals, which. Um, Again, it was was why we started the uh, why we started the company was for this uh, ability to purchase precious metals and take possession of precious metals that uh, you know were in the. You've heard of a gold IRA. Mm -hmm. uh, those are in most cases the gold IRA is where the gold is stored off in Delaware Depository or some other. Um, you know, some other depository. Sure. And the individual gets a statement once a quarter or once a month. Mm -hmm. This actually, this platform allows the individual from that checking account to write a check or typically a wire if it's a sizable metals purchase uh, and purchase the metals and have them stored just about wherever he or she chooses. Now, the act of home storage is. Um, a bit cloudy uh, because we don't have court precedent for it. It's never been tried in court. The IRA LLC platform has been tried in court dozens of times. It's been upheld structurally every time. In fact, in 2001, the IRS issued a field advisory statement saying that they would no longer challenge mm -hmm. the, uh, the structure of the IRA LLC. Now, there are still prohibited transactions, right? If an individual gets audited, now I should say this does not raise any flags. Uh, this doesn't put you on a, a hit list or a, you know, mm -hmm. something like that for, for doing this. The only public knowledge to the regulatory agencies or bodies is that you've done a rollover from Merrill Lynch or Prudential over to this self-directed IRA trustee and then invested into this limited liability company. Much like if your IRA bought shares of Apple Computer or Ford Motor or Chevron, same thing. It's just buying all of the shares of this newly formed limited liability company, which then the individual manages. So there's no uh, red flag by doing this, but individuals get audited you know, by the IRS uh, in, in different circumstances. Um, so if the individual has an IRA LLC, someone who's being audited, then that, that would come up through the audit. And it's been upheld structurally every time, but there have been a couple of times like where a, there was a Florida case in Florida where a gentleman had uh, used his IRA LLC and he had issued a loan to another company, typically not, not a problem at all, but he had an ownership interest ah. in the other company. Hmm. He was a part owner of the other company. So that's like beneficial use there. Yeah, okay. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. And that's exactly what the IRS looks for is, is benefit, use, or benefit. Uh -huh. um, so 
the the act of buying now it, within the tax code there is uh, an exemption to the eagles the U.S. eagle coins in gold silver and platinum they're all mentioned under section five one one two I think it is and in the very existence of this section is an exemption from the third party storage language um, as U.S. currency they don't have that same storage language. Um, so there, there is an outfit that's sprung up in the last handful of years that's it's all, hey, home storage IRA, get your home storage precious metals IRA. And um, that's raised some concern in the industry from those uh, you know, attorneys or, or uh, legal folks that might say you, you can't possess bullion. It's clear in the tax code. It has to be held by a depository. Well, bullion does but the eagles perhaps do not but we just don't have that court precedent so it's very much a we don't know until the irs rules on it so um what we will advise is for people to typically use a, a private vault uh a third some sort of a third party vault or storage mechanism siblings are not prohibited parties so you could you know if you trust your brother or sister you could store your eagles that are owned by your IRA LLC at your brother's house. Um, you wouldn't want to do so with your mom or your child or your grandparents. Those are prohibited you know, lineal uh, relatives or prohibited parties. But um, any other, you know, honestly, there are often a, uh, there's often a local storage solution. Um, if you live nearby, uh, you know, within driving distance of a city, there's going to be some type of a storage solution, not a bank deposit box, because uh-huh. as we discussed a moment ago, those are legally bank property. Um, you know, I've had clients that have rented a bank deposit box in the name of the LLC and actually had the bullion, the, the Eagles, I should say, which is a bullion coin, but uh, just to specify the Eagles, shipped elsewhere and um, with the intention of, of uh, perhaps using that bank deposit box at some point or perhaps not um but there are a lot of there are a lot of ways to get creative with metal storage so anyway that's the that's the um the update there i mean we just we advise to uh, you know we want to do everything above board here we're dealing with uh with regulatory agencies that put people in cages if they break rules so well in this case they would typically um there would be a um if you if you if you break a prohibited transaction with your IRA funds and it's you know like the Florida man for example, he had to pay. You know you have to pay. Okay, in t- 2007 you issued this loan for twenty thousand dollars. All right, well that and that that's that's a distribution. That's a personal distribution for the year 2007. So taxes you have, you, Taxes and interest. Exactly right. You started this whole story <clears throat> with the supposition that someone is getting access, for example, they may have an existing 401k through their employer, for example. From your experience, is the only way that people can access those funds to start this ball rolling is if they leave their employer and therefore they take a distribution from that 401k? Because I know that there are some that the, the, the wording of the 401k doesn't provide for other than like loans on 50 percent or a hardship medical disbursement or something but but what do you counsel people who say i don't think i can get at my 401k unless i quit my job yeah unfortunately there is little that we can do in those cases uh sometimes and it's a handful you know it's like five percent i think of uh, these plans allow for in-service withdrawals where you can you can do a rollover to an IRA, and that's the question for your HR person or your plan administrator. Hey, can I do a rollover to an IRA? Unfortunately, 95% of the time, if you're under 59 and a half and still employed, the answer is going to be no. So those funds are stuck. Now I've had people get very creative, and um, I had a, I had one person uh, negotiate a rehire. So uh, spoke to the spoke to the employer. There was a you know uh, feasibility there with the relationship and the size of the company to say, look, this is a life changing amount of money that I've got locked up in this in this four hundred one k balance. I really want to get to it to invest in X Y Z. 
can we can can I quit and and pre negotiate a rehire? Will you hire me back in in a week or the next day? Um, and that worked. So uh, it, it's a change of employment status. I had another individual who was planning to go part time uh, employment yeah. from full time, sort of a path, you know re- retirement path towards retirement. In the last few years, she was going to work uh, part time. And said, well, heck, I was planning on doing this in six months anyway. I'm just going to go ahead. It's confirmed with the plan administrator. Hey, if I if I switch to part time, will that trigger a rollover? Will I be able – is that enough of a change in employment status where I can do a, a rollover of my IRA or my 401K rather? And the answer was yes. So she proceeded with the um, – with the uh, move to part time. So, but unfortunately, yeah, in most cases with the active 401ks, those funds are locked up. Sometimes your 401k, um, I just came across one of these yesterday. Uh, the plan changes, you know, like it's with Oppenheimer or something, and they uh, they merge or they, uh, they, they 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 switch plans. They switch to Prudential or something like that. Well, that's a godsend if that happens because that triggers a role that triggers the ability before a certain date where you're able to, you know, just say, no, I don't want to roll my balance into the new Oppenheimer fund. I want to roll it into an IRA. So um, that's another triggering event that, that, that does happen. So but most most folks are are stuck, unfortunately. Will, if people want to find out more details or ask you questions directly, where can they reach you? Uh, perpetualassets.com is the best place to find us. We've got a considerable amount of information up on up there on the website and our news page. Um, there's an e- email address and a contact us button on there. Our phone number's on there, which is 888-281-2630. Call. You can push my extension 702 uh, directly, and you can get a hold of me directly. Uh, Gus and Ian and some other staff members are, are online to help as well when we get you know in the weeds. Uh, if we can't, you know, if we don't don't get to your call, you know, leave us a message, and we get back to you typically same day. So, anything I forgot to-, to ask you that I should have asked you about this that we didn't cover? Hmm. You know, the flexibility is a big one. The ability to change asset classes. You know, if you buy uh, boxes of silver eagles, let's say today at mm-hmm. sixteen, seventeen, that's you know, sixteen something dollars an ounce, and it shoots up in value tremendously, uh, you can sell some of that or whatever portion of that you wish, and move into you know, reinvest it into real estate, reinvest it into cryptocurrencies, reinvest it wherever you like. Uh, that's not a prohibited, you know, prohibited transaction to the IRA. So you can you can invest in all these different asset classes under the same an umbrella, uh, and a lot of people do that. You know, have maybe a, a little a piece of real estate over here, maybe some gold over here, maybe some cryptocurrencies over here, and maybe even a traditional stock account where they own some blue chip stocks or are trading stocks. It's a great platform for you know some people like to trade equities. And you can do that inside of this platform without calling your broker, you know, and do all the trading yourself. And it all stays tax deferred, you know, just like any normal IRA investment. So, um, yeah, it's a great platform. And I, I appreciate you having me on. It's, it's our, our company motto is trust yourself. Um, our goal is to give people a tool to, uh, you know, to, to get their money out, you know, and to... Uh, uh, to, to, into something that they believe in and, and, and that's uh, that they trust. Thank you, Will. We've been talking with Will Lear. He is the co-founder of Perpetual Assets. Will, thanks for joining us again on Reluctant Preppers. Thanks again. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. With surprising new concerns expressed about Dunnigan's changing hairstyle, one viewer even commented, that hair is dyed, fried, and laid to the side. But what you're not being told is Dunnigan's hair needs no dye thanks to the wonderful vitamin and mineral regimen that Melody recommends and is not laid to the side to cover any bald spot either since Dunnigan's full head of hair is exceptionally well attached. However, Dunnigan does use hair products only as a disaster prevention because he's at severe risk of catastrophic emergency situations. But although there may be some changes you don't like to hair, this is one kind of change you'll definitely want to have on hand if the situation gets 
it's hairy. Pure silver. And for a limited time, your first ounce of silver can be purchased at spot price with free shipping on orders over $99 by going to sdbullion.com slash rp. And you'll be supporting Reluctant Preppers as well. It's within your grasp to get your hands on the perfect change for hairy situations at sdbullion.com slash rp. P.S. Donegan was not harmed in the making of this video. Hey, Reluctant Preppers. If you haven't heard, we've already started our monthly one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle thank you gift to one active Patreon subscriber each month, signed by your host, Donegan Kaiser. And you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctantpreppers.